Uh, yeah, go for it. Perfect. Okay, share. Let me get into slideshow. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Alex already said, my name is Luke Ryder. Um, a little bit of background about me. I actually first got into philosophy back in the fourth grade um, when I took a class at Palomar over the summer. And, um, you know, since then, I've absolutely loved the subject. So I'm very uh, excited to show you why I think logical reasoning can help build a better student. Um, again, I'm Luke Ratter, and a special thank you to my mentor, Alex Gavo. So, sorry, I think my mouse is still in the Zoom. Okay, here we go. So before we begin, I'd like to offer you all a brief overview of the topics we'll be looking at. Um, and my thesis is to the side there. You can read it if you want. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Um, uh, number one, we're looking at what is logic? Uh, you know, very, very interesting stuff. Um, number two, we have informal logic. Three, formal logic. Four, we're going into why logic matters, particularly to students uh, in the modern day. Um, five through eight, I'm going to pre present some of my personal research. And number nine, we're going to go into a bit of data analysis. So moving on to what is logic, Persian philosopher Avicenna described the subject matter of logic as quote, the mental constants as they are placed for composition that will enable them to help us attain something in our minds that is not yet there. What a mouthful. The dude was a total nerd. Most philosophers are nerds. Sorry, Mr. Scavone. Um, but, you know, what it basically boils down to is this. Um, Avicenna and many philosophers, I think all of them at his time, and many today, were almost entirely influenced by Aristotle's um, foundation for logic. Um, Aristotle was the first person to put in place a, a, a real system for logic at a school. I believe it was named Lyceum. Um, <clears throat> so Aristotle's relevant logical theory boils down to this. Uh, so you bring many assumptions together, which join to form an unlike conclusion. And looking at what that says is we're bringing many or more than two assumptions. Uh, and in tandem, they join to logically uh, create an unlike conclusion. And the reason the conclusion must be unlike is because Let's say, for instance, I have this phone and I say, this phone is black, ergo, this phone is black. Um, it doesn't really tell us anything, right? It's valid and true, but only nominally so. So I like to think of logic in this way as those gears in the corner, gears turning like an hour hand on a clock or, or a minute hand or a second hand. It could be any hand. It could be like a barometer even. But uh, let's move on to informal logic. All right, so informal logic. This is the first form of logic. Um, it's very intuitive. People just get it. Uh, I have an example here rather than explain it all to you. Socrates is a man. All men are mortal. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. As you can tell, informal logic, you know, you have to follow uh, grammatical rules, full sentences, um, and it's absolutely complete. You know, it allows for uh, infinite qualifications that account for any state or situation, but it's clunky. And some students have a hard time understanding how complicated informal logic comes together to create valid arguments. Now, the example I've shown here is pretty easy. I think you'd all agree. Um, but it does get uh, a lot more difficult. And some of you might be thinking to yourself, ah, you know, this is, this seems pretty easy. I don't think we need a, a different form of uh, logic. And to that, I have a little example of some complicated informal logic from Plato's Republic for you. Okay, that obviously is a lot, but it is representative of how some students see uh, complicated informal logic. Um, formal logic doesn't have such weaknesses, uh, though still difficult for some students to grasp. It simplifies informal logic down to the bare necessities. Take this simplified version of the Socrates as a man argument featured in the earlier slide. So for A, we have Socrates, B, a man, C, uh, is mortal. So A is B, Socrates is a man. B is C, a man is mortal, or all men are mortal. Therefore, A is C, therefore Socrates is mortal. Um, this is concise, right? It, it, it's very snappy. Um, it allows for an increased ability to recognize valid arguments and distinguish patterns between different arguments. Um, like, for instance, let's say I gave you the Socrates as a man argument. Uh, we know that's valid, but I could give it to you in a million different ways, like, right? Uh, using different grammar and different tenses and whatnot. And following informal logic, you'd have to go through each one and verify that it's valid. Here, we can easily see, does it follow the pattern? If it follows the pattern, then it's valid. Um, so uh, for these reasons, a good understanding of formal logic, though you know sometimes seen as more niche, uh, actually works out to be more useful to a student. But 
useful for what? Well, logic touches all disciplines, right? Um, you, you might recall that Plato's uh, academy was the first academy, and that's where Aristotle studied. So um, logic finds itself as like the base for a lot of academia. Uh, you have, you, you know, you see in classical Greece, mathematicians, um, <clears throat> playwrights, all being influenced by logic. Um, so just going down and, and giving some uh, examples here, mathematics, mathematics, uh, in my view, and, and keep in mind, I'm not a mathematician, is essentially you're establishing a series of proofs for a conclusion. And that's uh, something that they teach you to do in logic, right? In fact, I, I remember Professor Scrivone, um, we were going through uh, proofs and I remarked that it was a lot like uh, trig, trig, uh, uh, trig, trig, it was a lot like trig. Um, and uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, literature, if a student's able to create valid arguments uh, and use assumptions to uh, lead to a conclusion, it also helps their ability to see logical arguments and see how assumptions can lead to a conclusion. And for the arts, um, I myself am an, am an actor and I find myself best able to really embody a role uh, when I understand why a character is doing something, you know, pretty much the logic behind their actions. Um, so this all boils down to my assertion that proficiency in logic gives students the tools they need to succeed. As we've already gone over, formal logic would be a far better tool. The difference between informal and formal is huge, right? It's the difference between thinking long division and writing it down, in my opinion. <laughs> so to gather information on whether or not students actually have these formal abilities, uh, I selected eight questions from the LSAT practice exams. Uh, four that tested informal logical reasoning skills and four testing formal logic. For those of you don't, that don't know, the LSAT is, a, um, is the law school's admission test. It's a very difficult test that really rig rigorously uh, quizzes the students on reasoning skills. Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, I administered this quiz to 14 students aged 15 to 21. All of them were Miracosta students. And in order to promote anonymity and reduce stress, I didn't gather information such as names and I allowed the students unlimited time. Uh, so next, I'd like you to take a look at these two histograms. Um, as you can see, uh, most students scored pretty well on the quiz as a whole, but comparing informal to formal reasoning skills, there's a clear issue. Students don't understand formal logic in the same way that they understand informal logic. Now this makes sense, right? As we went over, Informal logic is very intuitive, right? People are kind of born with the ability to just get in, uh, rather not born, but are taught the ability to just understand informal logic. But formal logic is something you need to be taught, right? We don't necessarily look at um, arguments and start symbolizing it in our heads. Um, so uh, we see that a lot of students are lacking this uh, formal logic capability. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you guys, uh, feel free to put it in chat or shout it out. Um, based on these scores, uh, which is on the whole less than 65%, uh, most students scored lower than a 65%. What do you think the average GPAs were? Any guesses? I'll, I'll look in the chat. Yeah, um, well, you know, what's interesting is that if we go on to the next slide, almost every student I tested had a 4.0. And, and so, that's very significant because, um, well, I'll, I'll save the analysis for next slide, but uh, almost every student had uh, a perfect 4.0. In fact, only five students did not have a perfect 4.0. Um, I also uh, took some time to analyze the formal logic uh, portion of the test to see if the students were using proper symbolic logical logic skills, you know, like writing down uh, their different um, uh, factors and rules. And I found that only 21.4% of students actually had that capability. Um, and I, again, this shows a clear and urgent need to begin teaching students how to symbolize logical reasoning. So <clears throat> before I get into the why of the urgency, let me address one clear issue with this data, uh, selection biases. So I, I did administer this test to honor students. Almost all of them were enrolled in the honors program uh, who attend, you know, Amiricosta, which is one of the better schools in Region X or Southern California. I mean, even California, uh, as far as community colleges go. Um, but this selection bias, you know, selecting from um, some top students shows that 
other students who maybe don't go to a really great uh, school, who maybe aren't in the honors program, could be struggling even more with this. So this shows us that students absolutely lack formal logic skills. And because they lack these formal logic skills, as they build, get into higher courses, um, it, uh, they'll start to struggle, right? Because it's my belief that as you reach higher levels in academia, you always kind of come back to logic, right? You're forced to think in these new and novel ways. Um, and, and being a good logical thinker really rewards that. Uh, <clears throat> um, so in order to under, ensure that students have at least uh, a, a grasp of very basic logical concepts, I think that schools should require, require mandate formal logical reasoning courses um, because we haven't required them. And we can see that the result of not requiring them is that uh, students just aren't um, getting, uh, students just don't have the ability to answer these questions. Um, but before I go, I want to leave you all with something that I learned in the process of making this presentation. So take a look at this student. Um, they had the lowest GPA of all tested students and their performance on the formal reasoning was absolutely dismal. Um, however, this student's student also created the clearest and most concise symbolic representation of the problem I had seen yet. You know, uh, in my opinion, it was absolutely remarkable. It's something I would have expected out of one of the 4.0 students who already had like a philosophy class or two under their belt. Um, the problem is that they gave up on the second question. In the margins, they scratched a cartoon of their mind exploding and an explanation for why they quit early. Quote, my brain is about to explode with these difficult questions. Um, but if they had stuck with it, they could have and most likely would have joined the exclusive four out of four club. I'll get to the point here. I don't mean to say that teaching formal logic will solve every problem, but if we give students the tools they need to succeed by teaching them formal logic, we'll give them the confidence that they have the ability to answer these questions. Um, and, and I think as a community college and as a community, we should be striving to encourage our students. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to take this time to make some special acknowledgments. Firstly, I'd like to thank Professor Scavone for his mentorship, not only in his classes, but also outside of them. Uh, I think he's great to interact with during office hours. I remember one time I walked in and, uh, or I guess zoomed in and had a couple questions about Kant and he was able to answer them all like a pro. Um, like all my presentations, I'd like to thank the moderation board and the audience. Uh, a special thank you to Alex, who I hope goes easy on me in the Q&A section. And, you know, of course, the grandfather of logic, Aristotle. Uh, can't have logic without him. So thank you very much, Aristotle. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. That was my presentation. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'd be very happy to hear. All right, thanks, Luke. Um, so we'll have five minutes for Q&A. Um, whoever likes to ask a question, go for it. And also no questions is fine too, you know what I mean? But I, I doubt I explained everything uh, quite that well. All right, so, oh, all right, uh, Alex Scavone. Professor Scavone, yes. Hey, great job, Luke. Uh, really appreciate the presentation, acknowledgements and, and a yeah, wonderful job. Um, actually, I, I have a question. Um, it's an open-ended question and just to keep in mind, I don't have the answer for this either. Um, but I'm just curious, uh, what you think in terms of if we should be teaching logic, uh, to students more and perhaps at an earlier age, when do you think, uh, personally would be a good age range or grade range that we would begin this process? Is this something that you think would be beneficial in a high school, middle school? Um, keep yeah, it at the I, community uh, college. And, mm -hmm. and again, just, just, just a reminder, I have no answer for this either. And uh, it's something that kind of plagues me as well. So I, uh, I actually, I took the liberty to read some literature on that question. Um, the Association for Symbolic Logic actually has guidelines for how we should teach students logic. I know originally it was in my work cited when I um, uh, joined Omni, um, but I decided it didn't necessarily fit the flow of the presentation. It would have made it too long. You know, I could go on and on and on about all of this, but the Association for Symbolic Logic actually encourages that you don't give, or at least you don't mandate uh, formal logic courses, stuff that teaches them logic specifically until they're in um, upper level classes like community college or
college, um, even graduate school. Before that, they recommend that you integrate teaching logic into their other classes, right? So I, I think that students should be learning this, uh, learning how to symbolize logic, at least at a very young age. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, I, I think I, I, um, at the end of elementary school, I think I was at a point where I was understanding um, symbolic logic. So I think going into middle school, starting sixth grade, uh, we should have a focus at least uh, for maybe one unit on showing students how to symbolize logic, um, but integrate it into one of their English classes, right? So it's not um, its own class in and of itself, because I, I think making it its own class might actually stunt the growth of some students because they're not seeing how it relates to their other courses. So that's my take on it. I think starting in middle school, students should be exposed to it. And then um, maybe as they get into upper high school, into college, I think they should be mandated to take real courses on it. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Professor Scavone. That's my take on it. You know, obviously I'm not an expert or anything. Um, maybe one day I will be. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's no, what awesome. I Awesome. Thank you so much. That was, that was great. You're very welcome. All right. Um, oh, I got one. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Alex. All right, Luke. So I enjoyed your presentation. Um, Thank you. I also took I took a philosophy of logic class two, so I see. Um, in your presentation uh, presentation, you mentioned that there are applications in mathematics, but also art and literature. Um, what examples of those? Uh, yeah, sorry. I um I meant to go into it more in depth there. Um, you know, literature. A lot of literature is understanding why writers say what they do. Like, why is this author saying this? What are they trying to say? Um, why, how does this lead towards a bigger theme or argument? And um, I, I think that students, as they understand themselves how to create valid arguments, uh, they'll become better at spotting valid arguments. So they'll be able to spot where the writer makes assumptions, where they make claims, and how those claims lead to a conclusion, right? And I think a lot of students, including myself, had a lot really hard time doing that because, you know, instead of looking for these claims and assumptions, they were just looking for one big statement of an argument. I did that all the time. I combed through Hatchet probably 32 times looking for one sentence that would solve all my problems. But really, I, I think students, as they understand logic, will start to get a more uh, holistic view. Uh, of how an argument can uh, be created by an author. And as far as art goes, um, you know, painting, the visual arts, I'm not very well versed in. Uh, I know myself though, I, I do do a lot of stage acting. And one thing I learned taking acting classes and doing acting myself is that in order to really embody a character, you must understand why the character does what they do. And in order to do that, you have to understand their logic. And even if their logic isn't necessarily correct, you have to understand, you know, what assumptions does this character make? How does that lead them to the, a conclusion and how does that conclusion drive their actions? And, and again, um, becoming a better logician will make you better at spotting these um, assumptions and conclusions. So in that way, I think being a logician can make one a better actor. Um, but as far as, you know, painting goes, uh, you know, there are some, all rules can be broken, right? And that goes with any discipline. Um, but with painting, there are some rules, you know, you have complementary colors and whatnot. And I think a lot of understanding what works and what is aesthetically pleasing to people is logically examining what has worked in the past. Um, so I, I think in that way, um, logical reasoning can help literature and art students and, and even other students. I mean, science, right? What is science if not the application of many disparate laws to one unified conclusion? Um, uh, or, you know, um, computer science. I mean, I was talking with my older brother's girlfriend. She's attending UC Berkeley for computer science. And she found me and I was doing some truth tables. And uh, she mentioned that that's something she has to work with. So I just think understanding basic concepts, you know, you don't have to be a master logician, but understanding basic concepts can definitely um, <clears throat> help prepare one for at least upper division courses where you're going to be tested on logical reasoning ability more. Gotcha. Uh, thanks, Luke. Great topic. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, very passionate about about all of this, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come and present in front of all of you. Uh, as you know, you probably know uh, the opportunities for students to present have been getting slimmer and slimmer. So just having this as a way to express some of my opinions was great. So thank you very much, Alex. Um, thank you to all the honors navigators. Thank you to the whole moderation board. 
I know they aren't here, but maybe, you know, afterwards you can pass on the, the, the thank yous. But yeah, unless anyone has any more questions, uh, I'll mute myself and pay attention to the next guy. Okay. All right. Thank you all again so much. All right. Thanks, Luke. Thank you for your presentation. All right. No more questions. So we'll go on to the next presentation. Uh, I would also like to mention before, we also have a presentation commentary form. Uh, post it again, and the typo is still there. Okay, should not use uh, copy and paste for that. All right, so for our next presentation, we have uh, Yun Seo Song, uh, men and their mentor is Jacob Strona. Uh, their title is Using Code Meshing to Achieve the Dream. About 50 years have passed since Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. However, King's dreams can be achieved today by the use of code meshing. So this is a pre-recorded uh, presentation. Uh, I will now fumble around to uh, share my screen. Okay, can everyone see the YouTube? I'm assuming yes. Okay. So um, if there are any issues, uh, just say in chat. Okay. There we go. And I'm assuming everyone can see the video. All right. So, yep, using code meshing to achieve the dream. Yeah, excuse me, um, Alex, I can't hear the presentation either. I think we were all waiting for the image to shift so we could, you know, make sure that it was playing, but yeah. Oh, okay, so it's, okay, sorry. Um, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, one second. Let's see. All right, sorry about that, everyone. Um, let me know if you hear it. Hi, my name is Yunse Song. All of you would have heard of the name Martin Luther King Jr. and know what he did to form the society that we are living in today. In addition to his name, you know he is famous for his 1963 I Have a Dream speech. But was his dream fully realized? To some, they see that we still have some work to do to bring King's dream into reality, but they do not know what we need to do individually to get closer to it. Our role seems small compared to what King did in the past and what larger institutions like the government can do today. This can especially be felt in education as all people tend to be taught the same foundations using similar methods, which can make it hard for people to even recognize problems that exist in education and society. This presentation will further elaborate on these problems that we have in education with a focus on standard English education that keep people from achieving the dream. 
It will also include my personal experience in English education to show how this is a general problem that many go through. Ultimately, through the lens of Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision, it will suggest that code meshing, a method of creating one's own English based on their identities, is a significant change we can make in English education to help both individuals and society fully achieve King's dreams. The presentation will explore various parts, but the core parts that are focused is the references of other speeches and ideals and use of rhetoric in the Eye of a Dream speech, what exactly it means to achieve the dreams of King today, and how the Eye of a Dream speech relates to code meshing. As I am sure you know, Martin Luther King Jr. was a Baptist minister and social activist in the Civil Rights and Peace Movement. His dream was to fight for freedom and inequality peacefully through protest. This dream motivated him to always work for civil rights and peace, which included leading marches and giving various speeches in public events. The Eye of a Dream speech is one of the most visible and successful results of what he stood for in pursuing his dreams. There are many other speeches of King that are famous, but the reason why Eye of a Dream is so significant is because it reflects the dreams he had more directly and memorably than any of his other speeches. He did so by bringing in and referencing the ideals of other speeches and creating an interrogative rhetorical style. The quote, I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character, indicate profoundly the society of equal civil rights that he dreams of. Anyone that hears this speech for the first time can immediately realize what King has aimed for throughout his entire life. To help create this image for listeners, the I have a dream speech references various lines in other famous speeches such as the Gettysburg Address, Emancipation Proclamation, and others. By including these lines, King allows people who hear the speech to feel familiar with his message and reminds the audience of the ideals that each of these past speeches had as well. As they get reminded, they realize the message of I Have a Dream clearly and quickly. I Have a Dream starts with five score years ago, which was also similar to the start of Gettysburg Address. By including this line, King encourages the audience to recall that the Civil War was also connected to the fight for freedom and equality for all. Another line in this speech, it came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity, is from the Emancipation Proclamation, which symbolized the promise of freedom for slaves during the Civil War when freedom depended on the Union's victory. Through these and other lines that King included in Eye of a Dream, he blended the dreams of each speech with his own. In doing so, he created a message of deep importance that people still remember and find significant today. In addition, King's Eye of a Dream speech included three main rhetorical strategies to convey his dreams more clearly. The first is voice merging, the combining of one's own voice with religious predecessors and other people's thought. King's voice merging included his own thoughts for civil rights and those of the religious predecessors he had as a Baptist minister. The next rhetorical tool he used is prophetic voice, which is the approach of urging people to take action to recover society from a state of corruption. It enables the speaker to address their big crowd effectively and increases the credibility of what they are saying. Credibility for King was especially meaningful because he was persuading the crowd to believe in and join his vision. For instance, when King declares, now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children, he is urging the public to action, arguing that the present moment is the time to stand up for peace and civil rights in America. This rhetorical strategy leads the crowd to realize the seriousness of problems in their society and their actions within it. The last rhetorical device is dynamic spectacle, which relies on the context of drama and tension in which it was situated. Like prophetic voice, it helps people join an action. For this speech and time, the context was the nonviolent civil rights movement King was leading to achieve his dreams for all. Dynamic spectacle reinforced King's dream because of this period, when people on a large scale started to feel the need to rebuild a society that was full of discrimination. The combination of these rhetorical factors allowed the Eye of a Dream to be delivered effectively and be remembered as one of King's best speeches. The methods of how exactly to achieve the dream of King have continued to be presented by people who were next to King when he was alive. 28 years after his death, a magazine interviewed people that used to know King when he was alive. The interviewer specifically asked about what individuals or the government can do to get closer to King's ideal world where his dreams are accomplished. Among many people, two interviews stood out. The first one was with Joseph P. Lowry, who was an American minister in the United Methodist Church and King's fellow leader in the civil rights movement. 
Fundamentally, his answer to the question was that individuals should peacefully aim to create a society where all are respected in their identities. His answer connects to establishing one's own identity in education as well. The second interview that stood out was that of Yolanda King, who provided a different answer from Lowry to the same question. Yolanda King is the first daughter of Martin Luther King Jr. and also took part in the civil rights movement following in the footsteps of her father. To fulfill the dreams of her father, she talked about the need for us to figure out a way to make sure that we all contribute by providing more opportunities for everyone in society. If equal chances are not given, it is eliminating the potential that people have because of their identity. In terms of education, her idea suggests that the education system must ensure that anyone can learn easily in education. Also, equal opportunities must be provided regardless of people's identities in education. Equal chances in education are what will create a chance for them to develop their abilities and defend themselves from discrimination in the long term. The two interviews are essential in the context of King's dreams today because Laurie and King are the ones who knew Dr. King very well and at the same time know what to do both as a social activist for civil rights and everyday citizens. The two perspectives that they provide stretch into how we can chase the dream of King in the present education system. Nearly 60 years after King's speech, many may feel that we are living in a society of less discrimination. However, serious problems continue to be seen today. First, various violent events related to inequality are occurring. One of the most recent and well-known events is the death of George Floyd. His death reflects what a big problem discrimination is. Even the ongoing protests that happen in support of the rights of all are not peaceful anymore. They involve violence and weapons and even hurt or affect people that were not involved in the movement. This form of protest goes against King's dreams to peacefully gain civil rights. Moreover, on a nonviolent scale, people's identities are neglected in the frame of language and its education. People are taught standard English, an approach that forces people to hide their identity in literacy and the language they use every day. If individuals' identities are not respected and valued early on and throughout society, discrimination will only continue to worsen. This state clearly shows that there is more left for us to do to achieve the dreams that King stood for in the past. To more deeply discuss this connection to language education, we can see an interesting connection to Eye of a Dream. The various factors that King used in his speech, his use of rhetoric and references to other speeches, similarly represent a form of code meshing and hint that it is a way of achieving King's dreams within education. Gathering the ideals of other speeches with his own completely blended his dreams with the meaning that each speech carried. In a similar way, King's identities and background as a minister, social activist, and father produced his own unique and effective rhetorical style. These two traits share a similarity with code meshing, even as it applies to language, because it allows individuals to form their own English out of the unique identities they have. Therefore, King's dreams can even apply to the way we learn language from the time we are young. Before diving deeper into the concept of code meshing, I'd like to define it more completely. It is different from the standard English that we actually learn, which limits our identities from being shown. Standard English is what respects spelling, grammar, pronunciation, and others in the formal and informal speech and writing that is widely recognized and educated. On the other hand, code meshing blends dialects, international languages, local idioms, chat room lingo, and the rhetorical styles of various ethnic and cultural groups in both formal and informal speech acts. With these factors, it is a language that is formed out of every element of a person's identity. Through different experiences that people had in English education, we can find its significance in its ability to overcome the disadvantages that standard English has in education and the positive effects that it can bring to us. Many parents or teachers have limited those from the same minority group from showing their qualities by making them use standard English, and this can become a reason why they are disregarded. This is revealed in an article titled From Outside In. The author Melix was a black woman who was taught standard English and raised by her parents to hide her natural use of English in front of others to prevent her from being disregarded. Ironically, rather than supporting their own people to use language that reflects their identity, forcing them to hide it created the effect they were trying to avoid. Melix's experience showcases the importance of language education. For me personally, they also reminded me of my own experiences as a young child. 
My parents also limited me from using my experiences in my English writing or showing my identities to other people in America. They thought that my experiences as a Korean would not be understood and respected by Americans who have a different identity of their own. As for Melix, the result was that I was disregarded by others. As I grew up, I appreciated the fact that my parents wanted to protect me from discrimination, but now I truly believe that my experiences are the most efficient way I can support my ideas in literacy. Whether in Malik's experiences or my own, it seems undeniable that embracing our own language and identity is what will allow us to judge one another on the content of our character. Although code meshing needs to be taught to chase the dreams of king in education, the reality is that standard English is being taught instead. The struggles that students experience from learning standard English instead of code meshing are clearly shown in an article written by Wan, Chinks in My Armor Reclaiming One's Voice. It demonstrates her own difficulties in learning standard English as a foreigner who learned Chinese as her first language. She mentions that as she became familiar with standard English, she felt her identities being simultaneously lost and discriminated against because of her first language. She often mixed her Chinese accent in her English, which was strictly prohibited by her teachers and family. Her English speaking could only be understood by her mom, which tells how serious her accent was. It took her a long time to fully change her accent into what was understandable. Her story reflected my experience as an international student from Korea. I too was taught standard English from a young age, and I also encountered problems when I continued to mix the factors of Korean in my English. Like Juan, as I got used to standard English and the different structure in English literacy, I also felt that my identity as a Korean was lost. Unlike King, who formed his own rhetoric and pursued his values, I thought that it was obvious that my qualities would hide in my literacy. Like Juan, I felt I was also becoming a part of a society that discriminates against one another for their race and identities in English. Code meshing in language education is a key to moving towards King's dreams. Yet, code meshing can also be used in more diverse areas that directly influence our life as well. As we get more used to this method, we will be able to expand King's dreams not only within America, but also around the world. This idea is supported by the article, The Place of World Englishes in Composition, Pluralization Continued. This article describes that English is a language that even more people will speak in the future. If code meshing is applied to English, it will be used more widely in academic writing by people from different cultures because it will be more convenient to use. In a similar yet surprising application, programming languages are another example of English and code meshing that deeply influences the world. Many of the most used programming languages are written in English. And as with our spoken languages, computer languages blend the languages people normally use with the instructions computers can understand. Specific actions and tools are given simple names. For example, print would be used to capture the meaning of several lines of code design to put something on the screen. The significance of these computer programming languages can also be seen in every device that is used today. Thinking about this influence, as well as the impact of algorithms and the identities of the programmers who wrote them, we can understand that a future that uses code meshing will be one huge step closer to King's dreams. In conclusion, when we remember the significance of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, we probably don't immediately think of education. We remember the civil rights movement, activists like Dr. King, Joseph P. Lowry, and many others. However, when I remember King's dream, where we all have respect for each other's unique identities, I remember the power of his language. With code meshing, we can continue his efforts and work towards an education that achieves and honors King's dreams, valuing the identities of us all. It can address the problems caused by teaching standard English, help resolve the consequences of limiting identities within minority groups, and also expand King's dreams around the globe. To close, this last page is a list of sources and articles I cited. Thank you very much for your attention and listening to my presentation. Hello, my All right. Thank I'll be you. happy to um, get some questions if you like. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thanks Yuntea, for your presentation. Um, so five minutes for Q&A. Uh, Feel free to speak up.
Okay, Yenseo, um, I was going to ask, um, how did you come interested in this research topic? Did you see uh, Martin Luther King's speech and then notice something with it? Or how did, uh, how did you come up with? Um, so this, um, the concept of code meshing was in our course, it's like the English class I took. So it compared code meshing with standard English and how code meshing became significant. And that was kind of like the article that I read. And then after on, I decided when I kind of thought of identities and respect in them, I like naturally thought of Martin Luther King's I have a dream speech. Because when I heard that speech when I was young, it was so powerful to me because of what he said and how he decided to kind of speak up for all the identities that were like lost in the past. So just thinking about code meshing and the identities that people have, it was kind of natural for me to think of this speech after all. Yes. Thank you for your question. You're welcome. Thank you for your answer. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Yeah. Okay, and to uh, follow up for my question, um, have you noticed code meshing in any other speeches or in how uh, others have uh, spoken? Um, I didn't, I'm not sure about that, but the articles that, there were several articles that kind of used code meshing as a method. And for example, one of the sources that I used was an article written by Young. And he used code mesh. He explained why code meshing is significant by using code meshing in his writing. So it was very interesting to see how he kind of used those things to kind of show people that it's really significant and it's really important for people to learn. All right, I see. That's cool. Yeah. All right, no other questions? Thank you. All right, thanks Thank you for Dale. listening. I, I, I loved your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so for our next presentation, uh, presentation it'll be by Daniel Hughes. Kayum, is it? Yeah. All right, cool. They're here. Um, and uh, their mentor is uh, Professor Jacob Strona. So their presentation, it's uh, also on YouTube. Um, it's called Modern Technology, the Increase in Violent Video Games Realism and its Correlation with Violence. Uh, the research provides an insight into the negative connotation regarding violent video games and its correlation to modern technology's influence on its users. All right, so I will share my screen again. Um, let me know again in chat if there is no sound. Uh, one second. Okay. Um, can someone say in chat if you're seeing YouTube properly? All right, thank you. Um, all right, so I'll play this. My name is Daniel Kum. My topic is modern technology, the increase in violent video games realism, and its correlation with violence. This presentation was structured so that the audience can be users of a computer. My English professor, Professor Strona, has guided me throughout this process and presentation. The goal of this research is to understand the complex connotation regarding violent video games and derive a conclusion based on the evidence and facts. The basic overview of this presentation will show the first two apps. It will discuss and show the realism in violent video games 
and its correlation with Baudrillard's ideologies. The next two apps will discuss and show cell shaded animation. It will conclude with recent studies and studies regarding the horror virtual reality games. This is the first app. This is the second app talking about the realism in video games. The video gives an insight into the correlation between video games and violence. Users show their heightened emotions through their actions by throwing their controllers or cursing. Although they might overly show their emotions for more views on their streams, it cannot be disregarded that their emotions are heightened from these video games. Mass media portrayed mass shooters as the epitome of gamers who played violent video games. They often state that these violent video games corrupt and erode their sense of ethical morality. Many politicians, such as Donald Trump, stated that we must stop the glorification of violence in our society. This includes the gruesome and grisly video games that are now commonplace. Tim too. Many articles defend these politicians without any reliable information or misleading information. Articles from newspapers allow false information to circulate as a reader cannot determine whether the article is the truth or just false information. Yet, recent research portrays that there is no distinct correlation to conclude that there is no correlation between violent video games and violence, but state that there are limitations in the research. Baudrillard's Ideologies Hyperreality can be defined as a niche where society cannot determine what is true and false. Baudrillard 2 Baudrillard discusses how the notion of simulacrum and its correlation with the current postmodern age is influencing society to strive for a false reality. Baudrillard 2 Simulacrum is defined as society imitating reality through representations rather than the reality itself. It is trying to imitate it and eventually replaces reality. It stemmed from mass media masking reality with false information. As American society cannot discern the truth, they regress into a reality where they base reality from signs rather than the actual reality and fetishize an inanimate object. Campbell 6 From Baudrillard's and Campbell's ideologies, the notion of hyperreality is becoming America's reality. The false reality gives an insight into the fetishization of weaponry, especially guns. The fetishization of guns has many of the politic politicians emphasizing the power of weaponry and manipulating the masses to a false reality. Campbell 5. As society is signifying weaponry as power and strength, it replaces reality with symbolism. Majority of the entertainment, like video games and movies, give an insight into their fetishization. Top grossing movies and the highest rated video games are all violent and correlate to weaponry. Entertainment such as Top Gun and Modern Warfare are all examples of the transition into a hyper-reality. This ideology pivots the focus of American society to violence and its reliance on guns. As American society is a hyper-reality from its fetishization and media, it portrays how violence is becoming the main source of entertainment. Especially regarding video games, many individuals desire realism in these video games from the fetishization of violence and weaponry. The hyperreality state of America provides an insight into how society cannot discern what is real and what is imaginary. The article provides evidence into how weaponry is becoming their form of reality. Entertainment systems, like violent video games, are fueling their obsession. From the limited data and research, I did an interview with some of my friends. I interviewed 10 different individuals through the form of a survey. From the survey, all of them stated they were angry and showed signs of an increase in emotion while playing these violent video games. Four of the individuals stated that they threw something because of the powerful invoked emotions. The data is biased, as it is a certain group of individuals who are categorized as gamers. Still, it provides an insight into how these powerful emotions in realistic games correlate to violence in real life.
The research shows that realistic games have been invoking more powerful emotions like hatred and violence. Almost 40% of those participating in my research have thrown something while playing these video games. Whether it is the mouse or the keyboards, this significant data portrays a correlation between the violent video games and violence. Although research neglects specific examples and focuses on the aftermath of playing video games, my research signifies that there is some sort of correlation between violent video games and violence. This is the third app. I will now go to the fourth app, Cell Shaded Animation. Games such as Valorant purposely make their video games more friendly by not incorporating the blood and make it seem too realistic. Rather than realism, it focuses on an animation between something realistic and cell shaded animation. Cell shaded animation is non photorealistic designs that make the animation and characters look more like a cartoon. Although it focuses on cell shaded animation, it still revolves around the certain aspect of reaching realism through a false reality. In recent trends, first-person shooters have been the focal point for many developments. Most of its users prefer these games and desire rea realism in these games. First-person shooter games are where you are the character and hold the gun. The first-person shooter games make the game more realistic and immerses the users. It makes his the users seem like they are the characters, and these games often revolve around realism. Study gives an insight into how audiovisual realism does positively re relate to enjoyment, Danielle's 30. Regardless, many games are focusing on cell shading. For instance, games like Valorant and League of Legends are the most popular games right now. Recent research has determined three different outcomes on video games and violence. It may directly affect your tendency to become violent. They might not participate in other activities because of their inclination to play games, and children who play these violent games are a selective group of children. Susie dealt three. Many individuals replace their violent inclination by playing violent video games. Those who play violent video games are also grouped into a category where they can be violent in the game together. Research also portrays that realistic video games affect and evoke their emotions. From the research, it is evident that the video games have become a replacement for violence. Although many individuals show signs of raging, it does not affect their actions and inclinations throughout the day. From the media's negative connotation on video games, research has become available. Still, the rapid developments of video games have limited the information regarding technology. Fornis 6, Drumon 6. Research has first been focused on 2D video games and has transitioned into virtual reality games. From the limited data, most of the research done states that there is no distinction in video games and violence. There was virtually no relationship between the employed measures of aggression, cognition, hostile effect, and aggressive behaviors. Drumon 5. As research was based on an older version, of games, it neglects how the most realistic games evoke powerful emotions. Research conducted on horror games give an insight into how the brain reacts to a false reality. As the brain cannot determine whether it is reality, it reacts by believing it is reality. It invokes powerful emotions such as fear. From the increase in the fear levels, many individuals portray realistic scenarios of how they will react in real life. Coping mechanism is apparent from their reactions to these video games. Bonus 5. The heightened emotions give an insight into how the brain determines this false reality. Bonus 5. The heightened emotions bridge the gap in whether powerful emotions are invoked when playing video games. The research also determines that fear in the horror genre of video games also affected some of its users after the research. Bonus 5. The fear evoked emotions influenced their sleep and some users even had nightmares after playing the video games. This gives an insight into how powerful virtual reality video games have become, as it influences their emotions even after playing these games. Although emotions do not correlate to actions, it portrays the significance of video games 
and its effects on reality. It bridges the gap in the correlation between video games and emotions. From the powerful emotions, it portrays how anger is evoked when playing these video violent video games. The heightened emotions when playing violent video games portrays how the users cannot distinct reality from the video games, especially with new technology that replaces the 2D versions of these games. How the user is uncertain about what is reality when it's immersed in the games. Even after playing these games, it has affected the users outside of the video games. Some users even reported that they have experienced frightened dreams and have powerful fear invoked emotions after they played the game. The powerful effects of virtual reality games indicate that powerful emotions are evoked from playing these games. Regardless, the research does not portray a direct connection between becoming fearful of these games. Rather, it portrays a correlation between the emotions portrayed in the video games. The current research only determines the outcome of the emotions, not the increase in violence. The uncertainty of how video games will develop may change how video games are perceived. Yet, the research provides that violence does not lead to violent behaviors. The false articles online create a negative connotation of the concepts of, video, of violent video games. From the research, there is a di distinct correlation between video games and violence. Regardless, my research does not state that video games cause violence. Rather, it portrays a correlation between violent video games and invoked emotions. The own awareness of reality and this false reality as virtual reality is developing portrays the route of violent video games in the future. The user's emotion of violence and anger may be influenced by video games as there is no distinction between the game and reality. Still, violent video games may be beneficial in the future, as research determined that it may be a substitute by violence in real life. Although the users have heightened emotions while playing video games, they might utilize the game to be a substitute for their anger. The ideology and concepts regarding violent video games are too underdeveloped and too limited to predetermine what will occur in the future. From the research, it cannot be concluded that there is a significant data or evidence to determine the correlation between violence and violent video games. Yet, it is easy to determine the route of violence correlation with violent video games. Baudrillard's concepts of hyperrealism correlates to the understanding of how video games are going to affect these adolescents, as it cannot discern what is true and false because of the mixture of reality and the imaginary. Video games have no restrictions regarding the law, and it is not considered reality. Regardless from the research, it is impossible to discern if there is a correlation between violence and violent video games. There is not enough data nor distinct evidence to conclude that violence stems from violent video games. This is a citation that I used throughout the presentation. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Sean Guac. All right, Daniel, thank you for your presentation. That was pretty interesting. Uh, I will now open it up for five minutes of Q&A. Um, does anyone have any questions? Hi, Daniel. I was interested, I was interested in your presentation and I was wondering what led you to kind of explore video game as your like, is it your interest or did you just think that it was a serious problem? Um, I think it was both my interest and how there's a lot of controversies regarding like violent video games and how a lot of people like say like uh, violence stems like in children stems from people playing these violent video games. So I guess that's why I decided to explore this topic. Thank you. So looking through your presentation, so there is no correlation from violence in video games to uh, physical violence, correct? Oh yes, current research states that there is no correlation and there is no causation, but uh, people say like there's evoked emotion from playing these games, but it's uncertain whether there is, like violent video games cause violence.
Okay, so I'm guessing that it's more of the emotions that would um, drive people to these types of video games, maybe? Um, yes, I think that's what kind of drives them, but also like uh, how the online format creates a lot of groups and friends. So I think that's another reason why people play these video games. Daniel, if I could jump in here, this is Professor Strona. Can you tell us a little bit about the research that you did and the process to, to come to the conclusions that you came to? Um, so basically I did past research regarding this topic. And at that time, I didn't really have a firm understanding of like the dis different concepts, especially modular arts ideologies. But um, after taking English 202, um, I kind of started to understand more about hyper-reality and how that's influencing our daily lives and activities that we enjoy doing. I just want to commend you on your work that you've done and the accomplishments this semester. And it was an, it was, it's an excellent, you did an excellent job. Thank you very much. Um, going through, uh, do you have any other ideas on uh, future research on your uh, on your topic, or do you have any plans to go elsewhere with it? Yes, I think with um, uh, virtual reality nowadays, there's more research done based on virtual reality since it correlates more towards realism and how it might directly affect the audience after they play these games because a lot of the past research focuses on outdated research or outdated games. And, and they also focus too much on a generalized population rather than gamers themselves. So I think with um, more research towards um, virtual reality and realism in these video games, will kind of help understand um, the correlation between these emotions as well as whether violence or in video games cause violence in real life and aggression. And uh, one final question, um, what was the most difficult challenge of doing this research project? Because I saw that you went through multiple games and then picking out especially the cell, uh, cell shaded uh, example. Um, I think the research process itself wasn't too difficult because I did have um, prior research already completed. So I did kind of understand the basics of these violent video games and kind of the research um, based on like how there is no correlation between violent video games and violence. So I guess um, I just kind of stemmed my research from my basic understanding from my past research. So um, I guess it wasn't too difficult to do the research itself. All right. Uh, thanks, Daniel, for your presentation. It's really, it's really something to see video games come out like that. Uh, yeah, so going through, going through our program, um, we have a break coming up right now. Um, there'll be two more presentations after this. Um, I'm just checking right now. Okay, so we'll have a 15 minute break. Um, this uh, breakout room presentations will begin again at, let's see, tw uh, 1037. So yeah, uh, 15 minute break for everyone. Um, feel free to explore other breakout rooms. There are other presentations going on. But yeah, 1037, we'll be coming back. And yeah, so any other questions or if you wanna chat for a while, I guess. 
Yeah. But thank you to everyone who presented so far. Um, it's really impressive. I'm, I'm really serious. I was going to present this Omni, but I have a lot of things under my plate. So maybe next semester. Yeah. Uh, thank you to everyone.
All right. Hi, everyone. Um, we're back from the 15 minute break thing. Uh, yeah. So, Sean, are you there? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Sean will be our next uh, our next presenter. So, okay, Sean Guac uh, with uh, professors Jacob Strona and Billy Gunn. Um, the title of his presentation is Movie Games, Expanding the Frame for Cinematic Genres in Virtual Reality. The presentation holds information about virtual reality and different film genres. It goes over a unique expect, uh, concept of VR gaming, where players can choose which film genre and do what they wish to do in the virtual world. Uh, this is a pre-recorded uh, presentation, so I'm going to fumble around and uh, put it up correctly, I hope. Okay, so again, let me know in chat if uh, something's wrong. Hello everyone, my name is Sean Guac, and this is my Omni presentation for Film 111 and English 202. The title of my Omni presentation is Movie Games Expanding the Frame for Cinematic Genres in Virtual Reality. My presentation covers a new concept that I have created for VR technology. The concept that I have created is a virtual world of gaming in which the player will take on the role of the protagonist in various films. The main genres that I have added in this presentation are horror, mystery, superhero, and supernatural. Each page has a description about the genre and two movies from that genre. The movie sections will have trailers for each movie and contain information about the protagonist and the setting they will play in. This is the homepage for the Virtual Genre Gaming Platform. Welcome to the virtual world. Before diving deeper into the presentation, we must learn what the virtual world is. A virtual world is a computer-generated world where people can design the universe they desire through their image. It is a simulated world from one's own creativity and image with two or three-dimensional models called avatars. These avatars are the characters that people can control in the virtual world through the keyboard, mouse, or other gadgets. The virtual world can be a place that you may have always wanted to live, live to escape reality. In the virtual world, players will experience a new universe where they will enter the world of the specific story they have chosen. Throughout the story, they will travel around this virtual world and visit each checkpoint to progress through the story. As the player progresses through the story, there will be short cutscenes they must examine. The cutscenes are given to the protagonist when they are not in specific scenes. They must examine it carefully, as these may impact the choices they make in the story. Throughout their stories, choices will be given to them in order to progress through the game. These choices will shape how the game plays out, and they must use the small cutscenes to make the right choices. After finishing the playthrough, the game will convert the saved file into a film, adding the full cutscenes and choices they made in the playthrough. Throughout the film, they will discover if they made the right choices or not. The first genre we hope to survive is the horror genre. The horror genre has always been one of the most popular genres in any story, as it is meant to scare or shock audiences with factors that are universally feared in society. The genre always has a killer, 
monster, or entity as the main villain of the story. As for the protagonist, there will always be a main survivor, who is often known as the final girl, which is incredibly popular in slasher films. This genre will take players to an unsettling place with a terrifying villain, and it will be the player's goal to make it through the story alive. The two films that I will be going over from the horror genre are Your Next and The Mist. One is a slasher film, while the other is a monster movie. Your Next is a slasher film. In this game, the player will take on the life of Aaron Harson, who is the main protagonist of the story. The setting of this film takes place in a family mansion, where as Aaron, you must save your family from a home invasion during a family reunion. Make no mistake, one tragic accident can seal your fate. In the monster horror film, The Mist, the main protagonist is David Drayton. As David Drayton, you will start a new life in a small town with your wife and child. The main setting of your survival story takes place in a supermarket, where a mysterious mist traps you and some townsfolk in the market. In this setting, you must find a way to survive through the mysterious mist and what lurks within it, and keep your son alive as you find your way back home to your wife. The next genre to be solved is the mystery genre. The mystery genre is a subgenre that is mostly involved in crime and thriller films. This genre always has a detective, investigator, or a sleuth as the main protagonist, with a mis mysterious plot for them to solve. The mysteries often include an unknown killer that the protagonist must identify in order to stop them. The genre has two different types, which are the open and closed mystery films. The open films will have the killer's identity revealed throughout the story, while the closed film will have the killer's identity revealed during the climax of the film. As the detective, it will be the player's duty to use all the clues that they receive to put an end to the terror. The two films that I will cover are Sherlock Holmes and Zodiac, both of which are detective mystery films trying to discover a killer. Sherlock Holmes is a mystery story where the player will take on the legendary detective in London trying to crack the mystery of the murders happening around the city. With your partner, Dr. Watson, you must track the killer and stop his spree with the clues and tips that you will find throughout your investigation in London. Zodiac is another crime mystery film where a sinister killer calling himself the Zodiac Killer has been leaving a trail of bodies across San Francisco. As the author, Robert Graysmith, you will help the police decipher the cryptic codes that the killer is sending to the police to see if they can lead you to the killer. While the Zodiac Killer was never found, throughout the end of the story, you will decide who this killer may have been through the, through the clues the killer left behind. The next genre we will fly through is the superhero genre. This genre focuses on stories about the main protagonist and their extraordinary abilities fighting supervillains and navigating their own moral dilemmas. This genre does not require that many other elements, 
but has the potential to add characteristics from other genres. The protagonists of different stories all have different abilities, personalities, qualities, and conflicts that are shown throughout the film. Most of these stories will take place in a fictional world where there will be action-packed scenes for the audience to enjoy. The players will now have the chance to become the superheroes they wish to be and save the world from the villains that threaten it. The two films that I will go over are Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness, and Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Multiverse of Madness is a superhero film that uses the elements of ideology to create its story. The superhero players will play as to save the world is Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange was a surgeon who became a sorcerer through a tragic accident that destroyed his hands and his life. As the Sorcerer Supreme, you will travel across the multiverse to figure out what chaotic magic threatens the multiverse. As you explore each universe, you may discover that other realities may contain that which you desire. Choose whether you wish to be happy in another multiverse, or live in your reality as Sorcerer Supreme. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is a superhero film with the relatability factor to create its story. Within the story, you will be an ordinary high school student named Miles Morales living in New York City. When you are bitten by a radioactive spider, you will gain extraordinary abilities that you can use to save the city. You must choose whether you take on the responsibility that comes with your new powers and stop the villain Kingpin to save the city you grew to love or run away from unknown danger to protect yourself. The final genre to uncover is the supernatural genre. This genre involves supernatural elements such as ghosts, gods, goddesses, and miracles. This genre can be mixed with many other genres, such as horror, religious, or thriller. It mostly tends to dive into the unknown territory where supernatural and religious elements are shown within the film. The players will enter a virtual world with supernatural abilities to stop a supernatural phenomenon happening in the story. The supernatural films that I will be covering are Fate, Stay Night, Heaven's Feel, and Mortal Kombat. Fate, Stay Night, Heaven's Feel is a supernatural thriller film where there are mysteries throughout the story which will keep players curious as to what happens next. The protagonist you will play as is a mage named Shiro Emiya, who lives in a city called Fuyuki. You are a student who wishes to be a hero of justice, and follow a specific ideology to kill the few to save the many. Will you continue to keep this ideology to become the hero of justice you wish to be, or give up on your ideology completely to save the person you love? Mortal Kombat is another supernatural thriller film with mysteries, gods, undead warriors, and magic. Players will take on the role of the son of the legendary warrior Hanzo Hisashi, Cole Young. You will be chosen to become a warrior in a tournament called Mortal Kombat, where you will fight to the death with combatants from other worlds to save your own, a world called Earthrealm. You must do everything in your power to protect your home, or the Emperor Shao Kahn will destroy your world and family.
This presentation came from the genres I learned in Film 111 and the virtual world from English 202. The reason I came up with this presentation was due to my interest in the virtual world. I always wish to escape reality one day and live in a virtual world with a new life and abilities. These are the sources that I use to learn more about the virtual world and the different film genres. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful day. Okay. Thank you, Sean, for your presentation uh, on the virtual world. We are a little on camera right now. Nice. So I will open this up for a five minute uh, Q&A session. Um, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. John, Professor Shona here. I want to commend you um, on an exceptional project. I'm really intrigued. I want to play each of the games that you have um, briefly outlined. It sounds like each one would be fun to play. Which one do you think you were most gravitated to? Which protagonist did you want to, when, when the game becomes a reality, which one do you want to play first? It's probably Eight Stay Night, Heaven's Feel. It's one of my favorite movies, so yeah, most likely that one. Uh, outside of being your favorite film, why else? Is there a narrative component or a genre component that, that you would want to? Well, um, the enjoy? story itself is actually um, something that interests me. I've always been a fan of mythology and um, like mythical history. So since it has a lot of that uh, element, that's the one that I would mostly like to play. Go ahead, on. Well, I really liked your presentation covered um, that covered lots of different genres and virtual real virtual reality. And I also liked how you introduced us to a lot of like examples and films. And I just wanted to ask, like, what sparked your interest regarding virtual reality, and also what would be your favorite um, film out of all? you just introduced us to? Well, um, virtual reality has always been something interesting to me. And as a person who read a lot of comics, I've seen a lot of characters have like the ability to warp reality however way they want. I That was one of my favorite uh, like powers in the Marvel comics, especially. So that's most likely why I am so interested in the virtual reality. And my favorite film from those is most likely Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. I think that one to this day is still one of my uh, favorite films. Thank you. All right, Sean. So I'm noticing it's a trend that you're delving into these movie worlds with like a predetermined uh, course of action, to be predetermined plot. And then how does that play into factor of how you'd want to immerse yourself into the world to make decisions possibly that the characters don't themselves don't want to make? Or I'm sorry. That, Can you repeat, you cut off a little bit. Oh, sorry. So I see with many of the worlds that you presented that they come from movies, that they have a predetermined plot, predetermined ending. And then I also see that you're coming in, being able to make different decisions. Um, does that play into how you uh, wanted the project where you're able to influence decision differently than how it else it would have come out? Well, um, actually the decisions that the players make will actually shape how the story will um, like go on. So they ch basically like the plot is there but they choose how the story is going to play out so the ending can be different from every single decision that they make okay cool thank you 
Uh, I'd like to dovetail off of that question. That was a, that was a great question, Alex. W would you say there would be an infinite amount of different story conclusions or would, I, I mean, I'm trying to think of the different uh, choices and how that might provide like a set number of conclusions or could it go in any direction? I don't, right now, I don't think there will be a infinite amount of possibilities. I think it will mostly just be probabilities from the choices that they make. It's very impressive. Do you think it's technologically feasible that this is going to happen or what? Because I'm ready to play it tomorrow. Um, maybe in the future. I'm not sure. I don't know. It's like a pretty difficult thing to... Um, maybe process so especially with like the multiple amounts of uh, possibility uh, possible endings that the story can have well i just want to say make sure and say again well done alex you're doing an excellent job moderating these sessions and i just want to commend you all for the work that you've done i got to get into class but excellent work john thank you All right. Uh, thank you, Sean, for your presentation. Um, I would definitely love to dive into the worlds that you have. So, yeah, the that final is breathing down my neck. Yep. All right. So we have one final presentation here, and on I see you're here. Correct. Uh, should I go ahead and share my screen now? Uh, yes. Go ahead. So we have uh, on here uh, with, with our professor, uh, Daniel Ante Contreras. Uh, Tower of representation is pop culture trend. What does our obsession with zombies and vampires say about us? Uh, this literary analysis explores the underlying causes of our culture's obsession with vampires and zombies and reveals the fears and fantasies of contemporary popular culture. So yeah, um, feel free to share your screen. All right. Oh, whoops. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Yan Nguyen, and I go by Anne. And this is my second year at Miracosta College. So it's been about a year since I started taking college courses here. Um, today, I would like to discuss the reasons why humans are attracted to movies that feature vampires and zombies. So I Throughout my presentation, um, I'll be focusing on the common themes that these two different genres suggest. So first I'll present my thesis and explain the reason and causes why we love these movie genres and go into further details as I go on. So for my thesis, um, I argue that human obsession with movies featuring vampires and zombies comes from human's innate desire to earn an eternal life that consists of no discipline and authoritative figures. In both the Twilight Saga and The Walking Dead, these um, fictional worlds demonstrate how humans think of death and mortality. As vampires and zombies live eternal lives, it is fair to say that humans are naturally drawn to such concepts of eternal life. Also, the relationship between the characters suggests that there could be strong bonds in the midst of um, disastrous situations. I think when it comes to these movies, uh, we're generally fascinated by ideas of a perfect society and utopian um, literature and films where freedom, equality, success, social harmony, peace and development flourish. I think the opposite would be the case in dystopian literature and sci-fi films, which is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'm going to discuss how certain factors and things in dystopian films keep the audiences interest, interested. So my presentation would consist of a literature review that explores the factors and reasons why humans are drawn to vampire and zombie movies. The primary focus of the study was on how these factors are manifested in popular culture. 
So vampires. Um, vampires have been shaped by a lot of elements of romanticism and humanism. Compared to the image of vampires in the early films and literature, they're now depicted as immortals who live in isolation. Vampires are portrayed in contemporary media as soulless individuals um, who struggle for survival from various um, perspectives. Stephanie Mayer's young adult vampire romance fantasy novel and film, The Twilight Saga, which consists of the four books, including Twilight, New Moon, Eclipse, and Breaking Down, became a worldwide sensation in 2005. In today's fiction world, the vampire perception is always evolving. Today's per society's perception of the vampire has evolved with time, becoming something what readers want. Although vampires used to have a reputation for being terrifying monsters before the late 1950s, the, va the first vampire romance novel came out. The idea of vampires is now glorified and admired and has acquired an iconic image which people often idol idolize. Since the publication of Dracula by Bram Stoker, although more than a century has passed, this book continues to have an impact on the depiction of vampires in our current culture and society. And I believe this inspires many authors to reimagine um, vampires in the present. So I think this most definitely applies to the vampires in the Twilight series of books and films. I argue that things that vampires have, such as their supernatural powers, keep the audience interested. Mayer's vampires are the epitome of 21st century monsters converted into attractive, um, good-looking figures with a bit of bad boy appeal. I think this is why vampire characters are overly glorified in the fantasy world. So while their true habit and behavior are just to murder humans for their blood, the movie appeals to the audience by showing that vampires in Twilight are much different from the typical ones. For example, um, Edward, as well as his friends and family, do not drink human's blood in this series, which differentiates them from the rest of the typical vampires. Instead, they drink animal's blood despite um, the temptation. So these things that kind of make them look more human. And I think these things make these shows more relatable to us in terms of moral aspects, human um, family bonds, romantic relationships, and friendship. Likewise, in The Walking Dead, the characters fight up the zombies together and establish um, romantic relationships, strong family bonds, and friendships. So zombies, every living thing's goal is to continue to live. When it comes to zombie films, we are likely to drawn, we're likely drawn to zombie stories as humans who have developed an awareness of our own existence, including our mortality, because it allows us to deal with the fear of death on some level. When it comes to stimulating our sinful human wants to feel our most basic um, innate fears, Zombie movies apply to all of these ideas. So the Walking Dead teaches a, the Walking Dead teaches us a lot about life in general. In the middle of a post-apocalyptic drama, it shows people the conflict of a typical postmodern society. The show's depiction of humanity falling apart in do real darkness both reflects and amplifies our fears and ideas about society. So according to Dr. Curl's feararchy, fear is defined as a state of anxious arousal associated with an expectation. In his book, our most instinctive fears explain our obsession with shows like Twilight and The Walking Dead. We have lots of descriptive phrases and figures of speech for fear, which seem to indicate that there are many kinds of fear out there. So The Walking Dead, which is a popular post-apocalyptic show on AMC, follows a group of survivors as they try to find salvation in the here and now through four different social institutions. 
family, government, religion, and science, which focuses on vaccines. According to the book, Postmodern Vampires, Film, Fiction, and Popular Culture, the show demonstrates a traditional understanding of how important family relationships are to the survival of a liberal society. So overall, in conclusion, I think the, shoot, the two shows are composed of very different subjects and topics, but the commonality here is fears, human desires, and family relationships between the characters that keep the audience stay interested. The desire to be accepted by family and not to be alone are deeply human concerns, which is one reason why vampire and zombie movies can be so addictive. So here is my work side of the page and thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Anne, for your presentation. Um, we will now have a five minute Q&A session. Uh, so if you have a question, please raise your hand, speak up. Um, so, and I've been wanting to ask, like, uh, how did, how did you stumble onto the fear aspect or the romanticism aspect of zombies and vampires? How'd that come about? So for the longest time, I've been a huge fan of vampire and zombie movies. And while I was looking for academic sources, I came across this article called Feararchy and I realized the reason why humans are so attracted and drawn to these ideas is because we crave fear um, in some ways, and that's part of our psychology, I think. So I think after finding that source, I decided to piece it all together and say that um, we like these genres because it shows our human desire to live forever and um, we also enjoy um, having this fear. So it explains a lot about our psychology. Well, cool, thanks. And uh, what plans for uh, future research would you like to do into uh, vampires and zombies? Or are there any or other mythological aspects? So one of the things that I struggled um, with while I was preparing for this presentation was I had a lot of different topics to cover, I feel like. So initially I was going to talk about both different aspects of these two genres, but then I decided to find a commonality there and um, explain and come up with one argument. So I think in the future, I would like to go in depth with um, the, these different topics, such as fears, um, more into psychology, I would say. So yeah. Um, any other questions? Sean, Brandon? Okay, and then I suppose one last question. Um, thoughts on uh, Shaun of the Dead? 
does that factor into, or have you seen Shaun of the Dead? No, I haven't. <laughs> okay, so as a zombie factor, zombie story, but it's more of comedy with the title memory, uh, mimicking Dawn of the Dead. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah, it, it still plays into fear, but it takes a lot of the mm -hmm. truth. So I was wondering if you- That sounds it. interesting. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'll probably look into that after. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Q and A question period's over. Um, on, thank you for your presentation. And thank you. No problem. And uh, let's see. That is our last presentation for today. So. Uh, everyone on Sean, Brandon, and everyone else who presented and who were in this room before, uh, thank you for presenting. Um, you've worked very hard and you've all shown a lot more uh, commitments, at least than I have this semester because I could have presented and I didn't. But thank you all again. Um, we have, I believe we have other presentations and other breakout rooms you can join. But yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. General, thank you. Um, have a great rest of your day. And uh, thank yeah. you. Uh, get sleep, um, rest, finals, you know, drill. Yeah. Right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank uh, you so thank much. You. Bye. See you around. Bye. Bye.